Live from Miami Subs Grill in Dallas, Texas, with the music of Emerald City, this is Sports Waves. Now, here's your host, Mike Ducey. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Sports Waves. What a show we have on tap for you over the next hour. Names like Johnson and Wanstead and Walsh and more. Stick around with us for the next hour. It's going to be a lot of fun. And allow me, first of all, to introduce my co-host tonight, a man that many of you know for his work on ESPN. Those of you around the country know him for his work with ESPN. Some of you throughout the Southwest know him for his work with Texas Rangers baseball. He does a little bit of everything. He does all of it very well. Norm Hitzkus. Norm. Thank you, Thank you Mike. Now, let me make sure this is correct. Baseball's the white one with the red stitches. Hockey's the flat black one, right? Okay, now we were, this is a football show primarily, but yeah. before we went on, we were talking about the fact that, you know, you do some, some Major League Baseball, or well-known for that fact, and you said, I think, jokingly, that you'll do baseball again when it gets underway in the 1997 season. Yeah, what did I'm, you mean by that? I'm ready for it. I think the 97 season, they'll have it all settled by then. They'll have figured out that there's not one left standing with any money, and we'll have a new whole new baseball league. <laughs> it's great. We'll I see tell about you, that. Tell you what baseball needs, Mike. Baseball needs a couple of for sale signs. That's what baseball needs. Baseball needs a couple of these people to stand on a corner with a handmade sign with cardboard. That'll teach them some lessons. Let's talk, let's talk some football as well here tonight. You've been a keen observer of the National Football League for many years. If you were going to characterize the season in general in the first half, would you say it's been an exciting season of football or the flip side of that coin? I wouldn't say it's exciting. I, I think that with all the rules changes, football thought it was going to have a much more exciting season. We come off a week in which, let's see, two teams won games last Sunday without scoring a touchdown. Pittsburgh got four field goals. Cincinnati had the wonderful collection of six field goals and a safety. We had two teams win by scoring one touchdown, Kansas City, in what may have been a game that set back pro football five years on Sunday night. And, and Atlanta beat San Diego. Those two teams couldn't have figured out where to go in the tunnel if they saw the light coming on on Sunday. <laughs> it, it's a strange season in which, Mike, they made an enormous number of rules changes to do one thing. Give us points. We're not getting them anymore. National Football League also has been known throughout the year, certainly as a league that a couple, three, four, maybe even five times during a regular season, yeah. you're going to get big-time games, marquee games that draw national interest. I can't think of the last time there was one. Finally, you've got Dallas-San Francisco coming up this Sunday. Well, we've had them. Mike, the problem that I perceive is that those teams aren't marquee teams anymore. I don't believe Kansas City and the Raiders are marquee teams anymore. I don't think Denver and Kansas City is a marquee matchup anymore. Sadly, after an incredibly gritty run here, it doesn't look like Buffalo's a marquee team anymore. We got a marquee matchup this week. Uh, Dallas and San Francisco is a marquee matchup. We've got two relatively healthy teams playing at the highest level, at least for San Francisco, they've played all year. I, Mike, if you rated the teams in the National Football League, this, in effect, is the Super Bowl of the regular season. These are the two best. And we'll talk more about that game and, and more around the NFL as our show continues. Right now, let's go into our studio audience. Mark Meter has a new addition to our Sports Waves team. Mark? Mike with me is the newest member of Sportsways, one of our, our great team members we have here. Her name is Maddie Caldwell, and Maddie and I are going to be working this audience, sort of like, I guess, Sally, Jesse, and Phil getting questions from our audience. And Maddie's a big sports fan. Uh, Maddie, why is it that you're so excited about being a part of Sportsways? Well, I tell you, you get to meet people like Norm Hitzkiss and Mike <laughs> Ducey and you, Mark. I also get to talk to people like Steve Walsh. So, uh, Steve, what do you think about bringing back... Uh, well, we don't have Steve yet, but we, we just wanted to introduce you to Maddie, let everybody know that she's going to be working this audience, and if you want to come out to Sportsways, you get to pe meet people like Maddie Caldwell and me. Mike, back to you. And we hope to have Steve Walsh joining us from Chicago here in just a few minutes. You I may have had one baseball call relevant to the work stoppage. I think those sports should understand the sports that play, college and pro football and now pro basketball, are the ones people are going to, going to follow, and those other sports run a very major risk. They have turned off an enormous number of people. Steve Walsh will be with us in Chicago. In just a few minutes, we'll talk about the Bears. And also, we want you to help us out with our Waveline question. Our Waveline question tonight is, well, we want your opinion on instant replay. Bring it back. Bring it back with some limited use. 
or don't even think about it. Yeah. Norm and I are going to talk about that, mm. and we'll get both of our opinions on that Do I topic. I get to vote, Mike? Yeah, you, you get to Good. vote. Only, only once, though. one 800 9002 That's the number. Jimmy Johnson will be with us shortly as well from his home in Tavener, Florida, to tell us which coaches are on the hot seat. Jimmy Johnson, the former Cowboys head coach, will be with us later on. One coach that is not on the hot seat is Jimmy's buddy, Dave Wanstead. He has the Bears in playoff contention. Dave Wanstead from Chicago to join us in just a few minutes. And Cowboy great Drew Pearson will be along shortly to help us pay tribute to an anniversary of a game Cowboy fans remember well and Redskins fans can never forget. We'll have Steve Walsh as well coming up after a commercial break and this word from our sponsor. I'm Heidi Kammer of the Waves, and Sports Waves is brought to you by Apex Authentic NFL Pro Line Apparel, available at Foot Action, by American Airlines, something special in the air, by Miami Subs Grill, great food served fast, and by the MGM Grand Hotel in Las Vegas, the world's largest hotel, casino, and theme park. We'll be right back with more from Steve, Mike, and Norm right after this, so stay you don't know what we could find Why don't you call me, little girl, at the copyright You don't know what we could see Why don't you tell your dreams to me Fantasies that you see Close your eyes, girl, look inside, girl Let my love take you away we're back on Sports Waves. Mike Ducey along with Norm Hitz because you saw the Sunday Heroes. Well, in the minds of Chicago Bear fans, our first guest was a Sunday Hero this past weekend. Welcome from Chicago, Steve Walsh. Steve, how you doing? Great. Steve, this is Mike Ducey along with Norm Hitz because... 4-0 and as a starting quarterback for the Chicago Bears this year. What's it been? What, what sort of magic do you have with this football team right now? Well, it's been a lot of fun, uh, no question about it. Um, you know, we're a talented team, and, uh, you know, things, things have gone right when I've been in there. Uh, whether that's to, to my credit or not, you know, we're still 4-0 when I've been playing. Steve, first of all, it's good to talk to you again. It's really nice to talk to you again. Steve, did you think that you had gotten into the stage where the chances of Steve Walsh ever being thought of as a number one quarterback again were disappearing because a lot of times people in your position get labeled. Yeah, no question about it, and that's why I signed with Chicago. New Orleans had wanted me back, but after they re-signed Wade Wilson, it was going to be back in, a, in a, probably a third string position, and there was no question I wanted out of that situation. I looked at Chicago as an opportunity. Uh, they wanted me to come in here and be the backup to, to be the backup to Eric Kramer. You know, and I also knew that Eric hadn't started a lot of games. He'd, he'd had flashes of, of real good play. But the, the most important thing is I was one step closer to being a starter, being the number two quarterback. Steve, we're going to look at some videotape highlights of you in action this year. Talk about the Chicago offensive system and what is allowing you to click so well right now. Well, the, the thing that I've found is that it, it uses solid pass patterns. In New Orleans, we got kind of caught up in, in some gimmicks as far as the passing game, and I really didn't fit into that situation. Here, I get back three or five step drops, some seven step, make quick decisions and get rid of the football. Those are my strengths, and that's what I've been able to do in the four games. Steve, are you tired of the Steve Walsh doesn't have a big arm stories? <laughs> well, it's kind of an old story, yeah. actually. Um, you know, I, I guess I've, I've fooled them for six years and hopefully six more. <laughs> but, um, you, know, you know, Steve, there's a bunch of guys with big arms who aren't winning football games. There's a bunch of guys with big arms sitting on the couch on Sundays watching <laughs> also. Um, in this game... In this game, you need to make decisions. I mean, you can throw the ball through a wall, but if you throw it to a defender, they're going to pick it off or, or whatever. You know, you need to go to the right guy when he's open, have a sense of anticipation, and those are what makes good quarterbacks. What's your relationship like with Eric Kramer? Well, he's frustrated, no question about it. Um, you know, when you sign a big contract, you want to come in and, and live up to your expectations. You know, there's a personal sense of pride there that you want to you prove to the people that made a decision in you that you're worth it. 
And right now I know he's just frustrated, but there's nothing really I can do about it. I, I want to go out there and improve my worth also. Steve, we're going to go into our studio audience for some questions now. Mark? Thank you, Mike. I've got Linda Jackson, excuse me, Linda Oliver here all the way from Jackson, Mississippi. And Linda's going to follow up on that question. You Taco Bell introduces the new big film menu. Five ways to fill up for under a buck. Three over a half pound. Like the fully loaded seven-layer burrito. The hearty Rancho Steak Burrito. And for a limited... Playing, you're a little bitter. Uh, you know, but he's... He seemed to have a, a decent attitude. You know, he's, he's going out there every, every day and trying to work and trying to help the team get better. And, you know, again, there's some frustration. There is some tension there, but, you know, there's nothing really I can do about it. And, and I, I know it's not tension towards me. It's just frustration from Eric himself that, that really causes that, that tension. You know, Steve, it, it strikes me there is one thing you can say to him. I know how you feel. <laughs> No question about it, and, and it's funny because, you know, the people around here and, and even some of the teammates say, well, you know, Steve, when you're in there, you know, we feel so much better, we feel like we have a chance to win. And I was in that same predicament in New Orleans with Bobby Bear, where he had gotten hurt. I had played well, but we'd lost four games straight, and everybody started saying, well, we need Bobby, we can win with Bobby. And there's just nothing you can do, you know, on the other side of the fence to, to, to get out of that situation until you get back on the field. Steve, back into our studio audience. Maddie? Thanks, Mike. Regarding some plays that may have been overturned if instant replay had been there, what do you think about instant replay? I never had a problem with it. Uh, besides the delay factors, which, you know, nowadays you're having uh, TV timeouts every, every time you get a first down, practically. Uh, I think that they ironed out some of those problems. I would love to have replay back. Steve, you're five and four now. How good is this football team realistically? Uh, what's the goal as it stands right now? Certainly the playoffs, but it's a team in a city that's starting to believe in its football team right now. Well, I, th I think you still have some doubters out there. I think anytime you know you you, you kind of have your ups and downs like we've had. You know, we we won the first game, we lost two, we won a couple, then we lost two more. You know, you're always going to have people saying, "Well, this isn't a very good football team." But the fact is, we're five and four. There's several other teams that are 5-4 and four that are going to make the playoffs, and we expect to be one of them. Steve, um, you would be able to address this firsthand like no one else we could have on the show. Give us, if you would, a capsule description of exactly what the playing field is like at Soldier Field these days. Well, I don't know. They might have resodded for the sixth <laughs> time this year. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty nasty. Obviously, the last game with the, the rain, um, but... I guess in uh, compared to the way it was against the Saints, it was in great condition. <laughs> but it, it looked like uh, it looked like they had a uh, tractor pull scheduled after our game against New Orleans. Steve, Steve, I never thought I'd say this. It made Candlestick Park look really good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, Steve, you shouldn't have any such trouble in Miami uh, this coming week in terms of the field conditions, anyway. But a tough ball game for you coming up. Best of luck there. We appreciate you being with us on Sports Waves. You'll receive a suit from Lombardo Custom Apparel and. Round trip ticket anywhere in the USA, courtesy of American Airlines. Steve Walsh in Chicago. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. And we'll be back with more on Sports Wave. Stay with us. We're coming right back. with Norm Hitzkiss. In 1973, the Dallas Cowboys kept a free agent wide receiver from Tulsa by the name of Drew Pearson. Before his career ended 10 years later, he would become the team's all-time leading receiver and Roger Staubach's favorite clutch receiver as well. Take a look at Drew Pearson in action. Nobody in the history of the Dallas Cowboys caught more passes than Drew Pearson. 
489 catches for almost 7,900 yards, leading Dallas in receiving for five straight years. of the great plays, all of the records, all of the winning teams. Still, Drew Pearson is best remembered for one catch. He's going long. Down the near sideline for Drew Pearson. Pearson makes the catch at the five. Touchdown! Would you believe it? For one stretch in the mid-70s, Drew Pearson made catches that were simply the best. Drew Pearson now joining us on Sports Waves. Drew, we saw it on the videotape. We might as well start off with the Hail Mary. <laughs> How many times a week are you asked about that play? Uh, I'm asked quite a bit, and the most asked question, of course, is did I push Nate right? Yep, yep. And the answer still is no. <laughs> the answer is no, and all Cowboy fans know that, right? <laughs> I know you've done this many times, but what the heck. Take us through the play. Tell us what did happen if you didn't push off. Well, uh, actually what it was, and I think Bud Grant, the coach at, uh, for the Vikings at that time, uh, described it best when he said it was like two basketball players going for a rebound. You know, you go up. I know you never mm -hmm. played, but... Uh, but. <laughs> <laughs> you go up for the rebound, there's contact, but somebody always comes away with the basketball. And there was contact there, but there was no deliberate push. And I was fortunate enough to come away with the football. So you could tell that answer's pat. <laughs> yeah, he's that. <laughs> yeah, we're going to look one more time at the Hail Mary as, as, we, as we talked about it just a few minutes ago, just to kind of reflect on what had happened. Certainly in the video, it looks like the right hand comes up and makes a push. But you're saying two great athletes going up. No, I don't think there was a push there at no all. No push. Too, he huh? tripped. Look at him. <laughs> down. Were, were, you wearing, were you wearing stick him at the time? No. No? No glue. No glue. No. Now, again, how much do you get fined for throwing that ball in the stands? Well, actually, I didn't get fined on that one, what? but uh, it was a uh, personal fine because I would love to have that football back <laughs> right now. <laughs> so. by, by the way, Mike, I, I know you may not know this, and a lot of people may not know this, Drew Pearson may still be the all-time cowboy leader in minor fines in his career. Right. How many did you get? Well, I got quite a few, and they, uh, as I look back now, I wish I had all that money back because... <laughs> There were $100, $150 only back then, and after a while, it got to the point where they started charging 1000 bucks, and then Ooh. I started pulling back a little. Now, a lot of it was you can't show the skin on your legs. Now, right. Drew, you, without a fine, you can do that. Now, go ahead. I don't want to no. show my legs. Just, 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 a, just a little bit. Just a little bit. Go ahead. Right. Now, see... In the NFL, see, Mike, that would have cost them 100 and a half. Right. Now, see, you, you, you guys don't realize, as a player, Part of the game, part of performing in a game, is how you look. And it was important for me to have my socks just right. It was important for me to have my tape job. I never let the trainers tape my shoes on. I taped them myself. Really? And I spent hours and hours in preparation before the game to get it right. But you got to know that that's, that's part of the game. Then all of a sudden, the NFL comes in and says, hey, we got to have everybody dressed like a, in a uniform. And you got to show your double stripes and, <laughs> and that kind of thing. And so my socks had to come down. So it was a ma matter of superstition or just wanting to look good? Well, both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> both, yeah, a little let's, bit of let's both. Let's look back 20 years ago this month, another of the memorable plays of your career, the, the great game in 74 against the Redskins, the great comeback. Talk about the game in general and, and this, this play in particular. Well, this was a very disappointing year because we had started off very poorly, and it was a 14-game season. I think we started off 1-4, and four, and we went up to RFK to play the Redskins in, uh, in their ballpark and lost. I dropped a touchdown pass. Yes. <laughs> I dropped a potential tough touchdown pass that would have tied that game, and we ended up losing, I believe, 28-21. So this was sweet revenge for me to come back 
and do this. And also because Joe Theismann, the quarterback for the Redskins, we went to high school together, and I saw him on the sideline just, you know, getting ready to lay into me with his uh, uh, his post-game comments about how great the Redskins are. So it was a lot of satisfaction to see him eat his words. <laughs> Cowboy fans who follow the game today, of course, think of a different number 88 when they look at that number on the field. Y your feelings about Michael Irvin having taken that number and continuing to wear that jersey number? I, I have no problem with it. Uh, since the Cowboys' policy is not to retire numbers, uh, I don't have any problem with it. Even when Michael uh, was presented that number, he wasn't the Michael Irvin we know now. He was going through two years of uh, injury problems uh, before he got to where he is now. So. Uh, even then, I said, uh, if anybody's going to have the double A's, I want it to be Michael Irvin because uh, the things that we have in common as receivers that we take the game very seriously, and we also worked hard to be what we were on that playing field. And so those comparisons and, and uh, with a guy like Irvin wearing the number, I, I feel proud he's doing the double A's good. I go places now and sign Drew Pearson number 88, and they say, what are you doing signing Michael Irvin's name? <laughs> His number, so... <laughs> It used to be, what's he doing wearing your jersey? So, <laughs> things change. True, so there's a, uh, a major regular season game uh, coming up, San Francisco and Dallas. Uh, whenever you talk to players, the general thing you get from them is, oh, I don't read the papers, I don't listen to sportscasts, I, I don't listen to the radio. Is that true? Uh, I read, I listened. Uh, I think most players do. I, I think people want to know what they're saying about you, even if they believe it or not. Uh, they want to know that. And uh, I think most players read those... Uh, uh, clippings and listen to what's going on as the announcers say uh, different things on TV. Yes. Funny when something negative shows up, all the people who aren't reading it have it on their bulletin board. Right, right. <laughs> so uh, somebody's reading it. And, uh, you know, a lot of things you can get from uh, the media. Sometimes you got to realize it's taken out of context, but sometimes you can get from things you can get from the media to motivate yourself to go out there and do something. I remember we were playing Philadelphia one year and I wanted Roy Nell Young, the cornerback, real bad. Silent Storm was right, his nickname. Right. <laughs> and uh, he had did some jawing the year before in a championship game and I couldn't wait to get back at him and uh, I'm pretty conservative leading up to a game and get vocal as the game goes on with the out there on the field but this is one I laid it on the line. I wanted him and I let him know it and uh, it worked. He stayed away from me the whole game. <laughs> <laughs> Drew Pearson, we appreciate you coming and joining right, us tonight. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. When we come back, we'll go down to the field for some of the highlights from week number 10. Some dramatic last-second comebacks in Sunday's game. The highlights you may have missed on the 10 o'clock news and a post-game feast with Chef Paul Prudhomme. He has our celebrity pick three and a chicken recipe. That's all coming up. the fate of your country hanging in the balance. Call toll-free 1-800-700-9002 right now. Do it for America. We're back on Sports Wave. You know, the 1994 NFL season doesn't look a whole lot different than the previous 10 in one respect. There are probably three or four NFC teams a notch above anything the AFC has to offer right now. Mark Meter has more on another wild Sunday in the NFL. Week 10 on the NFL hit parade on the countdown at number three. Tampa Bay quarterback Trent Dilfer throws the ball, then gets sandwiched by two Chicago Bears. The helmet to the ribs kept Dilfer down, but not out. At number two, Cincinnati's Derek Fenner drilled. The helmet pops off. Can we check to make sure his head's not in it? Climbing all the way to number one this week, Chicago's Tom Waddle. And folks, this is why receivers don't like to go over the middle. Tampa Bay's Thomas Everett puts the helmet to Waddle's face, and Tom leaves the game with a lacerated chin and a mild concussion. Week 10 is remembered for close games. Not necessarily great games, but close ones. 
Nine games decided by six points or less, including the Cincinnati Bengals and Dave Shula. Let's hear it for Cincy. They beat the Seattle Seahawks, and the Tigers didn't even score a touchdown. This safety plus six, yes, six Doug Pelfrey field goals give Cincinnati their first win in 94. Final score, 20 to 17. To the Metrodome we go, where the fans are dead serious, and Warren Moon was dead on. Last week's Sportsways guest threw 57 passes, completed 33, for 420 yards and two TDs to beat New Orleans by just a single point, 21 to 20. In another one-point contest, the Falcons dropped the Chargers 10-9, so San Diego quarterback Gail Gilbert calls for a pizza. Extra pepperoni, please. No, no anchovies. The Miami Dolphins swam past the Indy Colts by one point, but look at the rookie of the year, Marshall Falk, reverse the field on the big play for the Colts. Steve Young and the 49ers tuning up for the big Cowboys game in Candlestick. They beat the struggling Skins with a little help from Dexter Carter. He goes 96 yards on the kickoff return, this week's longest touchdown play. And John Elway seems to have his Broncos back on track. They beat the Rams by six points, but that doesn't spoil Flipper Anderson's fun after the Chris Chandler TD pass. The new dance craze sweeping the nation, the Flipper Flop. That's week number 10 in the NFL. I'm Mark Meter for Sportswaves. Dwayne Hager of Emerald City on base and Mark Meter on our NFL wrap-up. Thank you. Last week, Bruce Hornsby went two for three with our celebrity pick three. Our expert for this week, well, with Thanksgiving just weeks away, we thought we'd kill two birds with one story. Legendary chef Paul Prudhomme with pigskin and chicken recipes. dish is called brassica, and brassica means with greens. Hi, y'all. Hey, Mike. How you doing? Again, I have an empty pan. Well, the pick three is going to be tough this time because I've got two of my favorite teams in Dallas and, and uh, New Orleans. Of course, they're not playing each other, which helps a lot. I've got onions, greens, garlic, tomatoes, mushrooms, and uh, bell peppers. And so that and the chicken is the ingredients for this dish. I mean, we're going to see New Orleans just crush Atlanta. I'm using the ingredients to give me different flavors. Break them down. Let's take those black suited guys and push them back, push them back. And that's really a key. You know, if you get a combination of herbs and spices. San Francisco and Dallas, that's a tough call. Now, what I'm going to do is expose those two vegetables to a lot of heat. Two great teams. Who going to win? Well, I'll tell you. I'm going to put my money on Dallas. And the reason is, is because I cook a lot from smells. Now Houston and Cincinnati, that's easy pick. All right, I'm just about done. I got two things to, to do to this dish. And one is to put the chicken back in and then is to add the stock to it. Houston's going to wipe them out. I mean, just trample them. Because they're the Houston Oilers and they're going to oil the fuel first. The reason is, is that oil transfers heat very quickly. And then they're going to let the Cincinnati guys come on and they're going to fall over so they can trample them. How do you think they're going to trample them? It's, all I got to do now is simmer. I mean, it's completely done. So that's my pick three for this week. It's delicious. Mm. <laughs> I mean, what does a cook know about, about football? Thank you, Paul Prudhoe. We'll get some prognostications from Jimmy Johnson. Jimmy joins us from his home in Florida when we come back. Also, Dave Wanstead from Chicago. Stay with us on Sportsway. Five two six seventy nine hundred or one eight hundred eight legal two. Call now, or you could be giving up your rights to a fair cash settlement. Wanstead to the program. Uh, thank you. Now, what, where are you at, Jimmy? Are you, you, you in L.A. or New York? Or uh, no, no. Where I'm are at you at? I'm at my favorite place, just uh, uh, about three or four feet off my swimming pool, about ten feet from my my boat. So you know where I am. I got you. I'm hey. with you. 
Hey, uh, Dave, let me ask you, after grading the films today, uh, how did uh, that quarterback that's been around us for a long time, Steve Walsh, play? Well, I'll I tell you, uh, really, uh, you know, for the people that didn't see the game, I mean, it was vintage Steve Walsh. He, uh, uh, the only interception, actually the only turnover we had, it was a Hal Mary play before the half. But uh, up until that point, he was uh, very efficient, threw the ball well, made good decisions. And uh, it was really the most productive that our offense has been all year from a, a run standpoint and a pass standpoint. So, so it was a good shot in the arm, not just for our offense, but for our entire football team. Because we've been, we've been struggling a little bit to, to try to get some consistency. That's been the biggest thing that's been lacking in our team. Well, yeah, the other thing, you got a boost from Raymond Harris. I guess a fourth-round pick from Ohio State. Uh, uh, he's, he helped you out a little bit too, didn't he? Yeah, and you know, that's, he's, Raymond's played well. He's a, was a tailback. In fact, he, uh, you know, was a guy that rushed for 1,300 yards at Ohio State last year. We drafted him, and uh, at the time, we weren't sure where we were going to play him. And then when Merle Hodge got hurt, you know, he, we moved him over permanently to fullback, and, and we're doing, uh, trying to do a lot of things with him that, that what, uh, what you did with Daryl Johnson at, at Dallas from the standpoint, uh, you know, we're throwing it to him and we're handing it to him. And, and the luxury of Raymond is that, that he has, you know, tailback running skills that most fullbacks in the league don't have. Mm. Dave, this is Mike Ducey. Norm Hitchkiss is here with us. Uh, Steve Norm! Joined Dave! Us on the, uh, <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> Not bad, Dave. How are you? Good. Hey, this beats uh, 6 o'clock in the morning, right? <laughs> but the slot's open for you, Dave. Anytime you want to fill that 6 o'clock slot, it's ready. I'm still at the office, so... <laughs> Steve Walsh joined us a little bit earlier. Uh, he, he's your quarterback right now, then, huh? He's the guy. Yeah, he, he is. And, and you know what? Uh, you know, Steve, obviously, you know, as, as everybody in Dallas knows, I mean, he's he's been through this before. He's such a class guy. Because uh, uh, it's, it's a somewhat difficult situation here because Eric Kramer is, you know, he performed well through the whole, you know, offseason himself and... And then the injury, and he comes back, and we had won three games with Steve. He's in the lineup. You know, he's pressing up there to try to make something happen. Every incomplete pass that he throws, uh, you know, the, the, the stands, I mean, you know how the, the fans react and the media react. So, so I really thought that the best thing for our team was, was to get Steve in there, see what we could do at Tampa, and this would take a little bit of the pressure off of Eric. But, uh, but Eric's a fine player, too, and he's going to win a lot of games for us. Dave, we never used to discuss the role of the press in a football team, but how much does the pressure created by a media almost tidal wave of saying this guy should be playing Steve Walsh come into your figuring in the quarterback situation? Well, it didn't affect me at all. I mean, I, I stuck by Eric the entire time. I mean, I, I know what kind of skills that, that Eric has. Uh, I, I know what kind of skills that Steve has. So I, I didn't waver from that standpoint. Uh, what, what happened when he started turning the ball over, and I told him up at Detroit, you know, we, we went uh, six games and we had five turnovers, and then in the last two games before Tampa, we, we had nine turnovers in two games. And, and I, I called Eric in, and, and I told him that I know he's a little bit rusty and he's pressing, that he's not going to be perfect on some of his throws. That didn't bother me as long as he was throwing it to the right people and making the right decisions. And, and when I didn't get real comfortable with that, and I, and I thought that he was, was, was reacting a little bit too quickly, that, that's what, what made the decision go back to Steve. Dave, uh, just looking around the league, it looks to me like free agency and all the movement of players has kind of diluted a lot of the teams. I mean, there's uh, so much more parity now in the league than what there has been in past years. How do you think uh, free agency how, uh, affected your, your football team? Did it help your team, or do you think it... Uh, you're not as good as last year. Seems to me you're a better football team now. Yeah, there's, and we don't have the, the, the number of wins. We got five wins, you know. We, we don't have the, the, the six or seven wins right now to really show it, but, but maybe it's, it, it brings to light how bad we were last year. And, and, and our players did a good job of getting seven wins last year because there's not a doubt in, in anybody's mind, coaches, players, fans of Chicago, that we are definitely a better football team. And, and the free agency thing did help us. You know, we, we started the season, if you can believe this, and, and you know this, Jimmy, with nine new starters on offense different than what they were on opening day and three on defense. So, so that's almost unheard of, uh, you know, anywhere. And uh, it's, uh, but, but, but yet we knew we had better players and we improved the character of our team too. So I, I think it's helped us. And, 
and we'll reap some of those benefits here, hopefully before the year's over and in, in the next couple years. And we'll come back with more with Jimmy Johnson and Dave Wanstad on Sportswave. Stay with us. American Airlines, something special to Europe. The Big Kahuna. Philadelphia Eagles wide receiver Fred Barnett caught a career-high 11 passes against the Arizona Cardinals, including two for touchdowns. Barnett racked up 173 yards receiving, making him this week's NFL Big Kahuna. Back on Sports Waves, I'm Mike Ducey with Norm Hiskus, Jimmy Johnson, and Dave Wanstead joining us via satellite from their respective uh, homes. Jimmy, we just saw the uh, the Eagles uh, and, and Fred Barnett with his huge game this past Sunday. Talk a little bit about the Philadelphia team as we begin to talk about a few of the clubs around the league. Well, I tell you, Philadelphia's really playing well. I think Rich Kotite's doing an outstanding job. And yeah, it looks like that they, they lost some players uh, through free agency on defense, but they also picked up some good players. They they lost Simmons and Joyner, but they also picked up uh, Grossman uh, and Fuller and, uh, and Romanowski. And so they were able to you know, really solidify that defense. On top of that, Bud Carson, is, I think, is one of the top defensive coordinators in the league. And, and I think he is a big key to the success of that football team. Jimmy, I'm going to be Dave Wanstead for a minute. I'm okay. going to call you right after the show, and I'm going to say, Coach, i got to beat Miami this weekend in Miami, and you're down, you're down there. <laughs> Tell me how. <laughs> well, I don't know. The Dolphins are playing well. The only thing is they've got a couple of injuries. Uh, Keith Byers, they lost him for the season. And then their running back that's really had a, an impact on their game here the last few weeks, uh, Bernie Parmley, he's hurt now for one game. Uh, the only thing you can't predict is how Dan Marino is going to play. 95% of the time he plays great. Uh, and if he's hot and he's on, it's a tough day for the opponent. And you never can tell how the Dolphins are going to play against Chicago. I know they've got a big game coming up the week after that. Dave, I'm hey, going to be George. Hey, hey, hey Norm, yeah, if, you want to be, if you want to be Dave Wanstead, get up here and start watching some of this 4,000 <laughs> 4, uh, yards passing. <laughs> Dave, go ahead. You've got the big one with Miami. Another one that's going to, you're going to have a lot of attention drawn to it, of course, is the Dallas-San Francisco game. Your thoughts on that matchup? Well, you, you know what, I really haven't uh, had a chance to see either team play a, a whole lot. Uh, God, I, I have a tough time talking about Dallas-San Francisco. I, I might comment on Dallas-New York. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves, do we? <laughs> Why not? Uh, Dave's you're always asking played a coach. one at a time. <laughs> you're talking to a coach and asking me to comment on something a week from now. <laughs> Think about that, Norm. <laughs> hey, Jimmy, what do you think of that ball game? What do you think of that? Well, I tell you, you what, like... I'm not a coach this season, so I can talk about okay, it. I think it's going to be a, a great ball game. Uh, I really believe that this game will will determine who, who's going to have home field advantage in the NFC Championship game. I think everybody knows the 49ers are going to be there. Everybody knows the Cowboys are going to be there. Now, only thing that this game is going to determine is where they're going to play the ball game. Uh, Jimmy and Dave, a question for you. The, these games, it has been San Francisco and Dallas the last few years. Two things have struck me both times. Troy Aikman always outplays Steve Young, and the Cowboys have an ability to shut down Jerry Rice. Psychologically, isn't this an enormous monkey the Niners have got to get off their back immediately? Yeah, Dave, I, you I, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would definitely think so. Uh, you know, I, I think the, the thing with, with San Francisco is, uh, obviously, you know how good their, their offense has played the last few weeks. I mean, that's obvious as good as Steve Young's played. But, uh, you know, where they're at defensively, I, I think, will be the question. And, uh, you know, I, I think they're anticipating getting Richard Dent back and, and a couple of those guys back that are still nicked. And, uh, you know, as big a game as this is for them, they, they could be a little bit better, I think, San Francisco two or three weeks down the road or even when the playoffs roll around. Dave, before we let you go, another word about that game with, with Miami. You've gotten above the 500 mark now. How much would a win this Sunday mean to your ball club right now? Well, it, it would mean an awful lot, particularly uh, you know, against a team like Miami. But 
we're, we're the type of team right now that, that really uh, division games, non-division games, we're just trying to take them one at a time, and, and we're trying to get enough wins. We, we close out our season with two home games. We got the Rams and New England in Chicago in December, so, so the weather will be ugly. I mean, it'll be perfect if, uh, <laughs> if, 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 if we're close enough to where the games are meaningful. So that's, that's our goal right now, and that's where we're at. I'm going to take you down the road next season or the year after, gentlemen. Have you looked at the fact that there's a very good chance down the road you're going to coach against each other some Sunday? <laughs> David. <laughs> Wait let a me minute. An- <laughs> Jimmy, let me answer that for you. I'll take care of this one for you. Yeah. I hope so. uh, Let me just say this. I hope so. I hope so. It, it would be good for the NFL. Hey, Norm, do you know something that I don't know? <laughs> now, Jimmy, I know you're loving hanging out in Miami, but you're a football coach. <laughs> hey, well, let me, I'm going to give a no comment on that part, but let me just say one thing about Dave Wanstead before we let him go. Uh, I've been involved with football as a player or coach since 1953, and I've, I've seen a lot of teams that were coached well. I've seen a lot of teams that had a lot of talent. I've seen some teams that didn't have a lot of talent. And this year, I've been able to observe all 28 teams. I think Dave Wanstead's doing as fine a job of coaching as there is in the league with the players that he's got to work with. He's getting every little bit of talent that he's got out of that bunch. Dave Wanstead in Chicago, best of luck this weekend and throughout the rest of the season. Thank you very much for joining us on Sports Waves. We appreciate it. Dave Wanstead. Okay. And we'll be back with more with Jimmy Johnson when we come back on Sportsway. Stay tuned. By the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, the world's largest hotel, casino, and theme park. And by Miami Subs Grill. Great food served fast. Waiting so long to be where I'm going. Back on Sportsways, Mike Ducey, Norm Hitzkus, Jimmy Johnson via satellite from Florida. Jimmy, we want to talk just briefly about some coaches. First of all, coaches who you feel are doing the most with the talent that they have, and I know you like the job that Dave's doing. Well, I think I start right there for the simple reason. You look at some of the marquee players, and I guess you might call them marquee players, but the players that he's playing with, and a lot of them were backup players for other teams, and he got them through free agency. And so, yeah, I try to evaluate what kind of talent a coach is working with. Now, the Philadelphia Eagles have got talent, uh, but the thing that Kotite's doing with that talent is he's, I think he's really channeling them into where they're playing better than what they have in the past. I think Randall Cunningham, with the exception of the Dallas game, he's playing better this year than what he has in some previous years. Also, Bill Belichick, he's really playing well, he's coaching well as far as the defensive guys he's got. Offensively, he's not losing ball games, and I like that. On the other side, as far as the ones that are struggling right now, I, I think Jack Pardee down at Houston because he, his team really got hurt by free agency, and I think that has had a major effect on the team. And Bill Parcells is a, a little bit of a stranger. I think Bill Parcells is one of the finest coaches in the entire league. They started out strong, a, a little bit of out of his personality offensively with them throwing the ball so much, uh, but they really have struggled defensively, and, and I think that that could improve as the year goes on. The last one's Wade Phillips. Uh, I think when you have John Elway, you're going to have a chance to win any ball game, and I think they're starting to play better now, but they really struggle at the start of the season. Okay, Jimmy, before we let you go, quickly, does Dallas beat San Francisco Sunday? I think it's going to be a tough ball game. I, I think that whichever team uh, protects the football and has the fewest turnovers wins that game. Jimmy Johnson, we'll see you in the studio next week. Look forward to that. Thanks for joining us on Sportsway tonight. Norm Hitzkus, good to be with you tonight. We appreciate it. Thanks to Jimmy and Dave Wanstead, also Steve Walsh and Drew Pearson. I'm Mike Ducey. We'll see you next time on Sportsway. So long, everybody. Wardrobe by Lombardo Custom Apparel, America's finest custom clothing. Accommodations in South Florida provided by the Marriott Key Largo Bay Beach Resort. And in Dallas, Jimmy Johnson and his guests stay at the beautiful Melrose Hotel. Sports Waves is a presentation of DCL Media and Lone Star Hospitality Corporation.